we ran it on QI a few years ago. Yeah. Um, which was, there's no such thing as a fish. Yeah, there's no such thing as a fish. No, seriously, it's in the Oxford Dictionary of Underwater Life. He says it right there, first paragraph, no such thing as a fish. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another episode of No Such Thing as a Fish, a weekly podcast coming to you from the QI offices in Covent Garden. My name is Dan Schreiber. I'm sitting here with Anna Chazinski, Andy Murray and James Harkin. And once again, we've gathered around the microphone with our four favorite facts from the last seven days. And in no particular order, here we go. Starting with fact number one, and that is Chazinski. Yeah, my fact this week is that in 1874, there was a plan to transport dead bodies from all over Europe to Mount Vesuvius and throw them in. (laughs) Is this the plan of a (laughs) supervillain? Well, (laughs) maybe, maybe. So it's reported in a couple of newspaper articles from the time. There's one article in the Daily Gazette for Middlesbrough, uh, which describes how an American company has got some capital to erect uh, railways or like have trains running all over Europe and it takes people who have died who want to be cremated in Mount Vesuvius and it runs them up Mount Vesuvius and then it tosses them into the burning uh, lava below. And this, so I can't find any Proof like, modern this evidence of this. I can't <laughs> find that the company ever happened. But it seems strange that it would only be reported in the Middlesbrough Gazette. It does seem a bit well. weird. <laughs> um, it's also reported in the New York Times in the same year. Okay. So it just tilts you in as the train passes. It just sort of tips the carriages over the edge and then they tilt back on. Well, I think the train probably stops at the top because in the other article it mentions that there would be some sort of a chapel built at the top of Mount Vesuvius where you could have a small funeral service before, oh, yeah. oh. before tipping your family member <laughs> into the... It'd be better if the tracks went actually over the caldera and then just tipped them out as it was oh, going. Or yeah. just like the if the bottom just opened up, yeah. you just drop them out. Is there always lava at the bottom? No, there's not. See, is that's, that's a weird thing that they always say with throwing people into volcanoes. I like that. This is what they always say. <laughs> so they always say. <laughs> if there's an active volcano, yeah. the fumes from a volcano are enough to kill you. So anyone trying to oh. throw someone into a volcano would die immediately, purely just off the back of the No, fumes. no, you, you could do it at certain points. So uh, there was one more source, which from 1878, which was just before Vesuvius had an eruption, I think, and it was like Vesuvius was getting ready. Is this in the Hadley like, yeah. yeah. The West Lothian Butte. <laughs> <laughs> they were very European, the local papers. Um, and I think it was sort of bubbling and waiting to erupt, and that's the ideal moment. That's when you want to catch it. There's a really funny letter that was written to um, the New York Times around this time about this idea and it says it's recently occurred to certain thoughtful and ingenious persons that the constant fire maintained in the crater of Vesuvius generates an enormous amount of heat which is wholly wasted. Occasionally a native Italian has inadvertently slipped into the volcano and has vanished so suddenly and completely that not even a trace of garlic could be scented in the air (laughs) and nothing but a silent hand organ and a bereaved monkey remained to recall the fact that a citizen of free Italy had flashed into flame and disappeared based in the gases and it goes on because it's not just racist against the Italians this is the New York Times even the stoutest British tourist who has toppled into the crater while searching for a good place to boil a tea kettle has disappeared before he could fairly mention his purpose of writing to the Times newspaper and denouncing the neglect of the local authorities to rail in the crater well to be fair they've got us to a tea haven't they (laughs) they've Uh, nailed us yeah yeah. (laughs) tea drinking and whining I know sometimes we think journalism is always getting worse but I think there we have definite proof that it sometimes gets better as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I think it's quite amusingly reported. Garlic is an Italian trope. An Italian fell in and not even his baguette and stripy jersey <laughs> remained on the outside, <laughs> nor his trademark beret. And um, there's just one more part from this letter which is good and which the newspaper article reports as well, which is one of the advantages of this service, this funeral service, is that um, mourners who have seen the remains of their loved ones comfortably cremated in the finest natural furnace in Europe can straight away distract their minds and delay their grief by enjoying the view from the summit of the mountain and making a subsequent visit to all points of interest in Naples and the vicinity. And the, the, the newspaper actually reports that you'd get uh, the train ride would come with a voucher to spend in Naples once you got there. That's very awesome. I think this is really cool, speaking of magma. So uh, there's a new project to drill, see if we can drill further than we've drilled before into the earth and cool. um, see if we can get basically to the, where the magma starts. And... 
Isn't it weird that the furthest we've ever sent an object away from this Earth is 20 billion miles? So now I think it's the Voyager, wasn't it, that was sent out in the 70s. It's yeah. now 20 billion miles away. The furthest we've ever got into the Earth, and it's not for want of trying, is 12 kilometers. It's really hot down there. <laughs> <laughs> what? I mean, it's really cold in space. Yeah. yeah it's just because there's stuff there, though. The geologists are just saying, yeah. in space, you've got no stuff. People act like it's such a big deal, but actually it's mostly space. There are a couple of molecules per cubic meter in space. That's true. But that's much, much fewer than in the ground, where there are <laughs> loads of molecules, literally every centimetre. That's a molecule a party down there. <laughs> <laughs> the Slate.com official explainer question of the year for 2007 was, why don't we drop medical waste and nuclear waste into active volcanoes? Okay. And what was the answer? Because they'll blow up nuclear waste all over southern Italy. Oh, it'll that, erupt that it into... Answer. Is that the answer? Yeah, basically, yeah. if you put it in, must be. It wouldn't, it's not hot enough to stop it from being radioactive, um, but it would just kind of fire it straight back into the atmosphere. Yep. And so we'd have a nuclear volcanic eruption. Yeah. Sorry, and that got question of the year. <laughs> because I think that's one of the silliest questions I've ever heard. <laughs> I read, though, that one of the issues with a volcano eruption is that, obviously, over the months after it, lava can just still travel towards towns and they don't know how to stop it and they don't know what to do. Right. One of the things that they tried back a long time ago was they bombed the lava. So they literally bombed the area of where the lava was going into. Oh, wow. George Patton did that. The idea was to divert the uh, yeah, direction of the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you could get it all in a channel that yeah. goes into so the Yeah, so he launched a bombing attack on lava. Wow. Yeah. There's um, a volcanic island called Ferdinandea, which is off the coast of Sicily, and it is only above sea level when it's erupting. So normally it's not, and so it's not on very many maps. And so in 1986, um, the Ameri U.S. Air Force flew over and bombed it, thinking it was um, a Libyan submarine. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. There's that volcano in Tanzania, isn't there, that erupts black lava. Oh, it's yeah. the only example of, of a volcano erupting that substance in the world, and it's just because it's made of uh, carbonatite instead of silicate, silicate materials. Oh, yeah. But, um, wow. yeah, the lava is very, So it's colder very, very than dark. normal lava Exactly. Well. It, it can run at about 500 degrees Celsius, which is much, much cooler than normal lava. Um, this is really cool. Sicilians used to use the slopes of Mount Etna to keep their food cold. Okay. Because there's snow all over the slopes of Mount Etna, so they use the caves in the side of the mountain to keep fruit cold and things like that, and lemons, and yeah. Didn't Nero take snow down there and make like an ice cream kind of thing? He probably took credit for it, didn't he? Yeah. You know Nero. <laughs> <laughs> he tramples over intellectual property rights of others. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. The land speed record on a bicycle was set on a... On a volcano. Was it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. It was on Ciro Negro, which is in Nicaragua, I think. Uh, and it's like a really steep slope, and so people go down there quite often for fun. Uh, and this was done by a Frenchman called Eric Baron, known as the Red Baron, and he reached 107 miles per hour before his carbon fiber mountain bike snapped in two, <laughs> sending him tumbling down the last section of the mountain. He broke five ribs, dislocated a shoulder, and tore muscles in his hands. Oh. But yeah. got the record. But got the record. So yeah. Worth it? Do we know? Yeah. The thing I always okay. see is when people are trying to break speed records and that, for example, cycling, you cycle along, but you cycle along with an enormous truck driving mm. ahead of you, really, and you're really close behind it. Yeah. So you have to assess the speed quite carefully. And it's to yeah. get rid of the air resistance yeah. and all of that. So ah, that's if you're, right. if you're pedaling, whereas yeah. this guy is just going down a massive mountain. It's a freewheeling. Yeah, it's more like plummeting, really. Yeah. Isn't yeah. It? yeah. It feels like cheating as well. <laughs> it's true. Um, yeah. I was actually going to save this fact for later in the podcast because my fact's about running, but running is easier, supposedly. I read this earlier today. I couldn't believe it. Running is easier at about 20 degrees Celsius when the air temperature is there or higher because there are fewer molecules to get in your way as you run. Oh. Much easier in space. Much more difficult when you're going through the through air. The air. <laughs> I don't believe it, it just... makes that much difference. I only lost that one because I think there are a lot of molecules out today. Uh, yeah, my lane was full of molecules, to be fair. <laughs> Time for fact number two, and that is Harkin. Okay, my fact this week is that in 2010, an abandoned wastewater treatment plant in Baltimore was found to be home to an estimated 107 million spiders, with a density of 35,176 spiders per cubic meter. I just feel sorry for the work experience boy who had to count them. Because <laughs> he didn't have a fear of spiders before, but he does now. <laughs> yeah, it was an estimated number, and then they've kind of extrapolated okay. that to get the number. And they were all alive? 
They're all alive, yeah. They are great, though. Some of them can, eat, can catch and eat fish. I think they've just found out. They found Spiders can. Spiders no. can. They found out there are at least five species of spider, which one of them is the Dolomides spider, which can catch fish. The fish are, on average, twice their size. And they anchor their hind legs to like a wow. stone in a in a lake or a river, and then they grab the fish with their front That's legs. That's amazing. It's pretty impressive. Yeah, that is really cool. Um, I read that they found not too long ago the oldest spider web ever. Okay. And it Where was, was in that? it was in East Sussex, I think, and it was oh, in really? it was in amber. It was it, oh yeah yeah, oh, yeah. Wow. it was yeah. like from dinosaur days, and they were, they were studying it. And can I ask a definitely very stupid question? By all means. We used to it now, Dan. Yep. All right. Cool. Yeah. I'm learning to ask now. <laughs> um, why are we not, for the things that we want to preserve, let's say for a long time in the future, just coating it in amber? You know, like imagine if dinosaurs covered themselves in amber. We might have a full dinosaur. Yeah. Dan, I, th- I actually think that's brilliant. Do you? Yeah. Ah, I do. Aww. James doesn't. <laughs> I don't know where we would get enough amber because obviously it's yeah. in low quantities. No. I'm sure we have better ways of keeping things like I'm sure. Um, I just I, but just or... from history, the only things that have survived through that are in a perfect state are things in amber, yeah. and that just seems like an obvious time capsule of a of a thing. Okay, that's cool. Hey, get I'm on it, just, yep, Cam- oh, yeah, I'm Cameron. Just, I'm completely Stop sold what on you're this. doing. Um, um, so why do spiders not get stuck on their own webs? Do you know that? Um, oh, do they have some kind of lubrication uh, around their legs? Well, nobody is 100% sure, but what it seems like is that they leave their um, glue on the webs in only little blobs all the way around, and they just simply tiptoe around it so they don't stand on their own bits of glue. And if they do stand oh. on it, then it's a little bit of a pain, like getting, you know, chewing gum on your shoe or whatever, but it's not that bad. Um, but when a fly comes into it, he hits like 50 blobs at once. And so that's what makes them stuck because oh, they okay. get such a big amount. So it's kind of like uh, in a Bond film or something where you have to avoid all the lasers if you're a fly. A like, like Catherine Zeta yeah. Jones in that film mm-hmm. has to creep around them. A maze of glue. Entrapment. Entrapment. Yeah. Good movie. Great film. Yeah. Uh, so the ogre face spider called as such because it has massive eyes, which means it can't go out in daylight because it's much too bright for it. Um, but anyway, it is pretty ugly and uh, it does this really clever thing. So you reminded me when you said the spiders dropped little droplets on their web. First of all, it spins a web between its front legs. So it acts as a sort of like a a fly catcher Uh so it will hang down from its back legs above wherever it wants to stay to catch the flies and then it swings this web or net that it's made between its front legs at its prey and catches them and the way that it knows when to swing is it creates a target by doing a little white poo on the ground and it leaves a little white blob of feces as a target and as soon as it's in the dark as soon as it sees an uh, insect of some sort cross this bit of poo drops down upon it gets it in its net Wow. That Consumes it. I very clever. It's very clever. Yeah. Uh, what do you reckon the lifespan of a spider is? Surely it's Ten depends. years. Ten years. So I don't know the answer. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> what I do know is I know the, the as so far as we know, the oldest living spider. So the spider with the longest lifespan. Okay. 28 years. It's in Mexico. They had one that was captured in 1935. It's the world's oldest spider. Uh, and it's 28. It and what's 28 its secret? Does it drink a lot of milk or... Bird eating. Just bird eating. Okay. Yeah. I eat yeah. birds. I smoke 20 cigarettes a day. I don't exercise. I don't know how I do it. <laughs> <laughs> there um, was... I was reading about the oldest um, recorded person who lived to be 122 and she died in 1997. Jeanne Calvert was yeah. her name. Yeah. And she quit smoking, I think, five years before she died. <laughs> so when she was 117, she went, okay, come on, this has been enough. But I quite enjoyed, I put, did put this on Twitter the other day, she was born in the year that Edison made the first sound transmission and she died in the year that Hanson released Mbop. <laughs> <laughs> was that what did for her in the end? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> she was the one who said that I only have one wrinkle and I'm sitting on it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's her. She yeah. was cracking. So just to put the original fact into context, which yeah. is that there are 107 million spiders here uh, with a density of 35,000 per cubic meter. Um, the standard amount of um, spiders that we think are in like a British field would be about 49 per square meter. Wow. That's quite a lot, though. It's still oh, quite a lot. That's a lot. Yeah, yeah, that was a study done in 1958 in a Sussex meadow. In the 1950s, if you look at photos, they were actually overwhelmed with spiders. (laughs) Just all those films. That's why everyone's got their mouths shut in early photographs, is to stop the spiders getting in. (laughs) That's true. (laughs) Um, So is this a case of, you know when they say if you leave um, 
rats and they breed and they breed and they breed or mm. any is is this a case of just a total isolated sort oh, of really? spider just, farm i think they're just small oh they the baltimore one yeah um yeah that's basically it um they had no predators there um they were allowed to just create as much as they wanted and eventually there was 107 million of them it's extraordinary. Whoever You'd need was... a massive glass, wouldn't you, to put that out? <laughs> yeah, a big shoe. <laughs> <laughs> what have they done with it, do we know? The way it was worded, I think, I glanced at the article, they, it said um, they, the people at the Baltimore Wastewater Treatment Plant put out a call for extreme spider help, which <laughs> isn't an understatement. I think the grammar's different there. Extreme spider, the extreme semicolon, spider. help. Yeah. Do you think Spider-Man ever got any false calls of people wanting him to just get rid of spiders <laughs> in the house? <laughs> Guys, I'm dealing with some proper crime here. Batman, Bat, same thing. That's true, yeah. Catwoman, no, still not married. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, time for fact number three, and that's my fact. My fact this week is that, according to the Vatican, the greatest pop album of all time is Revolver by the Beatles. Oh. <laughs> I would have thought they would choose Abbey Road personally, but shows what hey. I know. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> the kind of joke that is greeted with a devotional hum. <laughs> um, what, according to the Vatican. Well, it's the Vatican newspaper um, who did a, um, they published a list of what they consider to be the best albums of all time. Is the Vatican newspaper called the Praley Mail? <laughs> <laughs> it's called Los, uh, Los Evitar... Romano, I can't pronounce it. Is Which it like is a very observer? funny pun in Italian. <laughs> <laughs> the weird thing is, first off, the Beatles were the ones who were more famous than any band in the world for having an association with a fight with the church when John Lennon said that the Beatles were bigger yeah. uh, than Christianity. Oh, he said yeah. bigger than Jesus, Jesus, but I thought yeah. he said it... Sorry, than Jesus, and he, but he also said Christianity would um, shrink and fade away mm. in that very same but interview. But I thought he said it despairingly. I think it wasn't... I didn't think he was celebrating the fact that they're bigger than Jesus. He was it did, just It didn't matter. It was, it. The ver- it was the very notion mm-hmm. of what he said. I mean, it led to uh, people were burning their records in the streets, throwing all their merchandise. There was a huge backlash. Really? Huge backlash. It was one of the biggest sort of moments of their career that they had to recover from. Wow. But so it's it's interesting. They've given him a pardon now. They've pardoned him for saying what he said. They they said the Beatles were satanic music. But the list is just, I mean, it's pretty, it's just a mismatch. You don't expect the Vatican to be saying the Beatles, David Crosby, Pink Floyd, Fleetwood Mac, Donald Fagan. Donald Fagan mm-hmm. is the lead singer of Steely Dan. So not even a Steely Dan album. A solo <laughs> a spin-off. work. spin-off. Yeah, a spin-off. So it's like the equivalent of like nominating a John Bon Jovi solo album and not a Bon Jovi album. Like It's just a very yeah. obscure choice. So I that. think this newspaper is trying to hip up, isn't it? I've read that yes. uh, the Vatican thought it was getting a bit dated. All this, we still love the hymns. Oh, God, we, we like our big long robes and our cross necklaces. I think there was a movement in, within this newspaper to say, look, we're with it, guys. And so now they report, they, so they review Harry Potter, which is... Again, uh, has had issues with the church. And they said that the Half Blood Prince was good because it showed a clear line of demarcation between good and evil. Ah, that's was- interesting because they're the Vatican's exorcist. Uh, really didn't like it. He no, came he says out, it's he had, satanic. Yeah. <laughs> he also thinks that yoga is satanic. I think yeah. Bit, I think he needs to. He needs to get with it. He's 89. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Probably too late. Uh, there was a big feature about this paper in The Guardian, and it said that until 2007, this was kind of the old days for Los Ovatore, there were two kinds of articles. Um, the first one was those in which a Vatican department had definitely directly intervened in, and they had a code for that which was three asterisks placed above or near the article. Oh. Um, but the other kind, the kind which didn't have the asterisks on, were those which had been written by uh, Los Zervatore staff, but they were so careful not to embarrass anyone that these articles were totally unreadably boring. <laughs> so right. you had a choice of reading either propaganda or tedium. Yeah. Uh, but that's kind of changed now. They've, uh, I believe they've shaken it up a bit. Um, yeah. But, but it's, not, it's, not the, it's not exactly the official voice of the church, is it? It's, no, it's in a weird one. place between yeah. official and unofficial. It's, it's, allowed, it's allowed in the Vatican. It's a paper that's kind of seen as a daily paper there yeah. um, and it seems to have a lot of it's it's the place where if, if the Pope has something to say there'll be the people to publish right. it it's so. very much the Middlesbrough Gazette <laughs> <That's> <laughs> exactly <laughs> do you guys know about the apostolic penitentiary system been yep. through it mate yep. <laughs> <laughs> that's on our that's the title of our spin-off podcast <laughs> <laughs> we're 20 in <laughs> right. no what is it so it's this tribunal it's the oldest um, 
It's the oldest established body of the Holy See. It's existed since 1179. And it's where you go when you've committed a sin that's too heinous to be forgiven by a priest. So if you've got to confess oh. something, you go to confession, the priest is like, whoa, out of my pay grade. Um, then you go to the Apostolic Penitentiary Tribunal, and there are five sins that are too evil. Should we guess what they are? Yeah, go on. I'll go for murder. Oh, no, murder is easy. Genocide oh. even is... You can get genocide forgiven by your standard priest. Can you? Yeah, you can. <laughs> what? Yeah. You're, what, your local... How many Hail Marys do you have to say for that? Look, it takes a couple of weeks <laughs> reciting in your room. <laughs> so three so of them goosing are... Goosing the Pope. What? <laughs> What's goosing Putting here? your finger up his bum. <laughs> Um, Maybe defacing One, his rings. So most of the same thing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, killing the Pope. You can't kill the Pope. That's understandable. Yeah. Um, so. There are three which just apply to people who want to work for the church. So if you're a priest and you've been in any way involved in an abortion, then you have to go here to confess it right. to directly to the Pope. Um, and if you're a priest who's been confessed to, and then you've broken your um, oath oh, yeah. not to share your confession, and then the only other one that normal people like us can commit, and we'd have to be sent to the Vatican, is if we. Um, deface the Eucharist. What, you mean at a local church if I get Body of Christ and I drop it? I think, drop I think it. dropping it is yeah. all right. You can play the five-second rule on it, oh, can't you? Right. That's probably the three-day rule in a Catholic <laughs> church, isn't it? So it's more if you're doing it intentionally. There was a scientist in America recently, for instance, who drove a rusty nail through a bit of communion wafer, and I think the church was pretty pissed off yeah. with him about that. I like that... Um, I just like the idea of the Pope listening to pop music. I don't think he does. It's obviously just this paper that's saying it. But there are a lot of... I like when you read about people who are in high power positions and they admit to liking certain things. Uh, so the Dalai Lama is very good mates with the Red Hot Chili Peppers and the Beastie Boys, which is just such a weird mismatch. But he recognized yeah. that he could put free Tibet concerts on, use the power of these pop stars. And he realized they're the people who spoke to people. So he became very good mates with them. Um, David Cameron, do you know what his favorite album is? Coldplay? No. Is it a Coldplay album? No, he, he said that it was Dark Side of the Moon by Pink oh, yeah. Floyd. Oh, yeah. That but he, everyone knows that that's a lie because everyone knows that his favorite album is The Queen is Dead by The Smiths. But he can't say that now that he's prime minister, though he had constantly said that before becoming prime That's minister. Very interesting. Really? Yeah. Then when he did say he loves a Smith, both Marcy and Johnny Marr came out saying you are not allowed to like us. <laughs> they banned <laughs> David Cameron. Yeah, that's ridiculous. It's not really up to them. I know, I just like yeah. them coming out and saying, it's ours and you're not allowed to like this. All well, musicians come out and ban politicians from liking their music. After a certain age, you shouldn't have a favourite album, you should have a favourite, I don't know, symphony. What's your favourite symphony, Andy? I haven't reached that age yet. What's <laughs> <laughs> your favourite album? Beethoven's Seventh is my favourite album. <laughs> 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 on uh, niche newspapers, yeah. Okay. Can I tell you about uh, my favourite one, which is uh, Jail Mail, which is a relatively new magazine, and it's for everyone in the prison system. Oh yeah. Okay. There are two others, which are called Inside Time and Converse, as in convict and verse. So Converse. Um, I think the J Daily Jail would have been better, but yeah. I'm not going to, you know. Uh, I think it's a weekly anyway. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it was it was hugely popular, and it's uh, it's sort of it's had to double its print run for its for its next edition, and um, yeah, it's it, the, it has advice on what to do when you're up before the governor. And uh, details of uh, reading projects and how to find employment. And I just is it written so cool. by people in by prisoners? I think a lot of it is, yeah. Um, Former news of the world. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Got a lot of journalists in there. Uh, I just think that's cool. Um, can I just on the Beatles? Yeah. I didn't realise that apparently their concerts all just smelled of urine. And if you looked around the aisles, you saw women's pee. And Bob Geldof has attested to this. So this is a because women used to turn up and wet themselves so excited. That's true. They? These days, the Rolling Stones gig smell of urine, but that's the act. <laughs> <not> the... <laughs> okay, let's move on to our final fact, and that is Andrew Hunter Murray. My fact is that for the first 50 years of the Olympics, the only event was the 200 meter sprint. <laughs> <laughs> which must have made the two weeks of the competition extremely boring in the most part. Um, is this the modern Olympics? No, this is the ancient Greek Olympics. Okay, right. So this is from a book uh, I've just got called Eureka, Everything You Always Wanted to Know About the Ancient Greeks But Were Afraid to Ask by a guy called Peter Jones, and it looks like it's full of good things. And it basically says, for the first 50 years,
is it was the Olympic game, not the Olympic <laughs> Games, which is a nice way of putting it. Yeah. Um, and then after 50 years, they added the 400 meter race. But the cool thing is, if you won it, the entire Olympiad was named after you for the next four years. So it would become the Kevin Olympics or whatever that was instead of the Athens Olympics. Oh, Isn't that great? Really cool. The Usain Bolt Olympics. Yeah. Right. And then they started adding funkier things later, like boxing and wrestling and chariot racing. Uh, after a couple, after 200 years, they added a race in armor. Oh, that sounds good. <laughs> yeah. That's great. I read that that was the race in armor. Uh, the only body coverings was a helmet and shin guards. Wow. <laughs> that was what the race in armor, and the rest of it was completely <laughs> naked. Okay, I wasn't imagining that at all. I was thinking big, heavy plates of armor, so, so it's a challenge, like American football or whatever. But the 200 meters wasn't even 200 meters, was it? I think it was 192. Yeah. Um, so really? That's true. Did they call it the 200 meters, or we just called it that? We, we've, uh, that's an approximation. It was called uh, Stadion, which oh, is yeah. where we get the word stadium from, and there was a measurement of a stage based on that. Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. And there were other games as well, I didn't realize this. There was the Pythian Games in Delphi. Uh, it was really short games. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and the Nemean Games, and uh, and if you won the uh, the games at Delphi, you got laurel. Obviously, at the Olympics, you got olive. Uh, at the Isthmian Games, you got pine. And at the Nemean Games, it was celery, which you won, uh, yeah. which I find very pleasing. Um, where the Olympics were held in 2012 in London, uh, that borough, Newham, uh, is the most physically inactive borough in the whole of the UK. Oh, wow, that's good. Yeah, that's where I live. Um, <laughs> is it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I live I live in Hackney, but I'm literally I'm 10 minutes away from Stratford. Um, and 39.17% of people in Newham take no exercise at all. Where's Newham? Stratford's... You, it's 10 Stratford? minutes away from where you live. Yeah, but I've never heard... <laughs> he couldn't be asked to Newham. go there. <laughs> <laughs> in the 1932 Olympic 3,000 metre steeplechase, it was actually run over 3,400 metres because an official lost count of the number of laps. <laughs> That's so good. That's so good. Yeah. You'd, fi- and you'd, you'd, be, you'd realise soon after you'd forgotten... I don't know how many they've done. <laughs> yeah. And you'd wonder if anyone else would spot. You can yeah. put, oh, the poor guy. Well, the runners, as they're coming in, as they're going to the final yeah, lap, well, he they're looking f- at you and you're not saying anything. You're like, what? <laughs> An- another one? What are we- yeah. Well, you'd just try and bluff it out, wouldn't you? Because you'd know if you tr- if you stop them too early. you think, oh, I definitely don't want to stop them too early because yeah. they'll really know. But if I make them do another lap... It'll look like it's their fault for being slow. <laughs> yeah. So did the, was the winner the person who crossed the boundary at the right time or no. the person who finished at the wrong I end I think time? it was the same person, but it would have been at the end when oh they officially God. finished. Because you must... Embarrassing. And everyone must have put on a real burst to get to the finishing line and then <laughs> and yeah. no, no whistle, no <laughs> crowds cheering, just... That would really be a funny. great Olympic race, the we're not telling you how many laps. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. That'd be great. That's, a, that's a brilliant yeah. idea. Sometimes it's one, sometimes it's yeah. 25. Yeah, that's a really good idea. Okay, so that, that torture. and then we put them all in amber at the end. <laughs> <laughs> this is That's a this really is, good yeah. idea. So there's no adequate training yeah. for it. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Well, that is the spirit of amateurism, which they would want. They oh. wouldn't. They weren't. Uh, they weren't amateurs from the start in the Olympics. No, they weren't. Either. They got loads of money, didn't they, yeah. in the ancient Greek Olympics? I think someone's worked out that um, Gaius Apelius Diocles was extremely good at winning money. I think in his Olympic games, and he won a lot of events. And it's been worked out that he won what would be the equivalent today of over fifteen billion dollars in modern day Whoa. cash. <laughs> wow, fifteen billion! <laughs> Just from winning a bunch billion. of Olympic events. I think they work it out on the percentage against, like, say, for instance, someone in the army. Or yeah. something that we can... Yes. It's really yeah. hard, though. Yeah. It's so hard doing that. There are three or four different ways of calculating it. Anyway, so it sure was it was, that. It was, it was enough to... So he earned enough to pay the entire salary of the whole Roman army for more than two months. <laughs> so they could work out like that. Wow. Which he didn't do. They, they got... Um, <laughs> they ask him the classic, what are you going to do with all your money? <laughs> <laughs> what are going to pay? <laughs> <laughs> do you want to hear an Olympics-themed joke? Yes, please. Uh, Marcus was so slow in the races that the groundsman locked him in for the night because he thought he was a statue. (laughs) Isn't that good? (laughs) It's quite. It's funny joke. That's from. That's an ancient ancient ancient, uh, athletics joke. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I was going to say in 1908 uh, when we hosted the London Olympics. First of all, we did say that was obviously the first time we hosted it, and we weren't supposed to host it. The reason, uh, in fact, fittingly in this podcast that we didn't was because. I think uh, somewhere in Italy was supposed to host it and Vesuvius erupted in 1906 oh, so they couldn't really? hmm. so we stepped in like the heroes that we are we then cocked it up in a number of ways so we included we had all the flags up on poles around the stadium as you
you do. That was the first year that became tradition. We had the Chinese and Japanese flag up, neither of which countries competed. We forgot to include the Swedish and American flags, which were competing. So obviously the Swedes were really polite about that and were like, oh, no, don't worry about it. So we'll just never mind. And America brought their own flag and their own pole and hoisted it up themselves on oh, the pole at the end of the stadium. Did. It was this sponsored is- by OXO, by the way. The 1908 Olympic Olympics. Games. Yeah, it was actually sponsored by OXO Indian Foot Powder and Odol Mouthwash. Oh, fantastic things to be sponsored by. Yep. Yeah. Was, it, was that OXO, comma, Indian foot, foot Powder? I don't think it was used for that. This oh, isn't right. a, OXO was originally used to <laughs> cure athletes' foot. <laughs> No. And we are announcing, actually, that today is our first podcast that's sponsored by OXO Indian Foot Powder. (laughs) Um, In India, they have a thing called the Rural Olympics, Hmm? uh, and they have three types of competitions in there. They have rural games, such as kabaddi or wrestling, uh, modern sports, such as athletics and football, and performing sports, such as acrobatics, twisting an iron rod by placing it on the Adam's apple, <laughs> passing a tractor over the rib cage, and cracking a big stone by placing it on the chest, etc. What do you mean, what, a letting tractor? a tractor go over your chest? Yeah, that's just one of the sports. How can you win at letting something happen? Do you just... <laughs> <laughs> it's more of not losing. <laughs> Imagine the tr- disappointment after the tractor drives over your chest and you look up and you see a judge giving you a five. Five? <laughs> <laughs> My lungs have collapsed. <laughs> Come on. That's why you got a five. <laughs> <laughs> I have a fact. This is really fun. The, they think that the starting position for running races at the ancient Greek Olympics was just standing up next to each other yep. and with your arms stretched out in front of you, <laughs> <laughs> as opposed to the crouching. So what a funny way of starting a yeah, race. Isn't that so brilliant? Odd. What It might work if you then push your arms backwards and it might give you some momentum. Yeah, yeah the a molecules good point. out the way. <laughs> <Slip trees>. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's it. That's all of our facts. Thanks so much for listening, everyone. If you want to get in contact with any of us about the things we've said over the course of this podcast, we can all be got on Twitter, either at, at QI Podcast or individually on at Schreiberland for me, James. That's egg shaped. Andy. At Andrew Hunter M. And Anna can be got on. You can email podcast at QI.com. And if you go to no such thing as a fish.com, we've got all of our previous episodes there. And we'll be back again next week with another episode. And we'll see you then. Goodbye. Yeah.